Hello and welcome. The call for an independent Kurdish state is gaining momentum in northern Iraq, especially in light of a referendum proposed for later this year in the northern city of Kirkuk on whether to remain a part of the country or join the autonomous Kurdish region. But the prospect of that vote has driven Kurds, Turkmans and Arabs there further apart, which according to some has allowed Al-Qaeda to gain strength in the region. But this was highlighted on Monday when a triple suicide attack killed more than 80 people and injured nearly 200 in Kirkuk, the deadliest attack yet in the oil-rich city. The Kurds inhabit roughly 20% of Iraq, as shown in the shaded regions of this map. The autonomous region of Kurdistan in the north of Iraq was largely seen as one of the more stable in the country. Well, some are now worried it may become the next hotbed of sectarian slaughter. But don't forget, we take your questions and comments on this subject, and you can reach us at the numbers on the bottom of your screen. Joining me today to discuss the Kurdish situation is Joost Hiltemann, the uh, Middle East Program Director at the International Crisis Group, where he manages a team of analysts researching armed conflict in the region. Mr. Hiltemann has just written A Poisonous Affair, America, Iraq and the Gassing of Halabja, recounting the events of that attack on the Kurds in 1988. Joost Hiltemann, thanks very much for joining us. Thank Good you. Good to have you with us. Now, I have to start off by asking, you know, I said at the introduction of the show that uh, a lot of people are worried that uh, places like Kirkuk uh, could become the next hotbed of sectarian violence. But I gather you don't think that's necessarily the case, and I wonder why. Well, uh, on the one hand, Kirkuk has already been a, a city that has been very tense, and uh, we've seen a number of uh, suicide bombings there in the past year. And so the latest one, uh, really a horrible attack that happened, uh, unfortunately is just uh, one more in a series of attacks. And as we approached the, uh, the, uh, the time for a referendum, I think there may well be a further spike in violence. Now what about uh, the influence of the jihadis, Al-Qaeda and the like, uh, growing in the northern region of Iraq? I know that uh, that's something that's obviously that people are discussing now. Well, because they're being squeezed first in Anbar, now in Diyala, and maybe some of them are going to, um, to move up north. And so we've seen an attack on a Turkmen a Shiite village uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and so we may well see more of that. Is this presumably because the eyes of the security forces, the U.S. and the allies and so on, is, is still on Baghdad? On Baghdad and on the belt of uh, mixed population areas around it. So in terms of uh, the call for the greater autonomy of uh, Kurds in, in the northern region, um, that, that voice is getting loudly, louder. How likely is this referendum to take place? They've been saying it may happen at the end of the year. Well, of course, the Kurds have insisted that it should happen before the end of the year, and the Iraqi constitution supports them in this. Um, but uh, I think from a, just a practical point of view, it's very unlikely that it will take place. There are so many procedural questions that need to be uh, answered that haven't even yet been addressed that I, I think it just will not happen. If, the, if there is a referendum and the, and the vote is uh, very much in favor of uh, the autonomy, the breaking away, what impact do you think that would have on security in the region? Well, if the referendum does take place, first of all, I think uh, Kirkukis who are not Kurds are very unlikely to participate. They will boycott the vote and they will also reject the results and uh, it could well lead to violence then. Uh, alternatively, if the referendum does take place, if the Iraqi government organizes it and all the Kurds come out and vote, um, then uh, uh, so there will be violence. But if it does not take place, then the Kurds in turn may well uh, turn violent or at least make good on their threat to pull out from the government in Baghdad, which also would not be good. Now, unless the, uh, the vote is, is taken and is, is fully, uh, in, in fully involving everyone, how valid could that be then in terms of actually you know, any action taken following that? Well, if everybody is involved and accepts the results, then it would be a very good thing. Uh, then you have a consensual ar arrangement, essentially. But I don't think uh, that's going to happen, it's for, uh, because the other communities in, in Kirkuk are dead set opposed uh, to uh, the annexation of Kirkuk into the Kurdistan region. Of course, uh, next door in, uh, in Turkey, there's uh, a growing impatience with the Turkish generals as well. And so as far as how Turkey might react and how ready do you think they are to move in the military? I don't, I, I, don't, I, I don't expect a Turkish invasion. I think uh, the, uh, the, uh, the saber rattling at the border is, is related more to internal Turkish politics than to uh, the situation in northern Iraq. But all the same, having so many troops on the border, any incident inside Turkey could trigger a spillover into northern Iraq. I hope it won't happen. And when people talk about you know, the, 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 the issue of a referendum and greater autonomy, there's always the, the, the statement that this could trigger uh, uh, separatist movements within their own nations, the neighboring nations. Is that a realistic thing or is that just used as an excuse? Well, it's partly an excuse, probably, um, but it's partly also uh, has some basis because the Kurds in Syria, in Turkey, and, and in Iran are not very happy. Mm. Uh, and when they see the Kurds in Iraq moving forward with a great deal of autonomy, possibly independence down the line, obviously they're going to look and see, can we do this for ourselves? 
And of course, one of the recommendations made by the International Crisis Group when it comes to how to move forward, and it's a fairly comprehensive list of uh, suggestions for each of the parties involved, one of the key things is greater dialogue between the various uh, you know, factions, the, the Arabs, uh, the Kurds, and the Turkmen's, and so on. How wide apart are they on the, in the first place? How far apart are they in their initial stance? Well, I think they're far apart. Uh, the, the Kurds want to incorporate uh, Kirkuk and other areas where Kurds live in the mixed populated uh, population belt into the Kurdistan region. The Arabs adamantly oppose that. The Turkmen's come down somewhere in the middle where they will accept uh, a special uh, uh, status for Kirkuk uh, for an interim period after which uh, the status can be determined. And of course, another one of the key decisions or key recommendations, I should say, is is uh, an oil revenue sharing process that's fair, that's considered fair to all parties involved. Now, how who decides what's fair when you have approximately 20% of the population sitting on 40% of the oil in the country? Well, I think on the oil revenue sharing, there is already a basic agreement, agreement that has been reached between the, the political parties in Iraq, and we're now just waiting for the other part of the uh, oil law uh, to, to be agreed upon so that we can move on. Um, so I'm not so worried anymore about the oil revenue sharing, but, but FAIR is generally considered to be, you know, uh, depending on your population in any governorate, that's uh, proportionally how much uh, of the revenue you will receive. Now, isn't there, isn't there any complication by the fact that, for example, the Kurds have been doing their own unilateral deals with oil and so on up to now? Is that going to complicate a final status uh, on the oil sharing? Well, not on the revenue sharing, but yeah. maybe it is, it is related to uh, the contractual issues and, and who gets to manage the oil fields, who gets to issue the contracts, who gets to make the deals with the international companies that are going to come in to explore and exploit the oil fields that exist. Just, I want to get in a call from uh, California. We've got Marvin on the line. Marvin, what would you like to ask? Well, first uh, of all, I uh, wanted to say that, uh, uh, well, I want to ask your guess, uh, is it possible that Turkey would ever allow the Kurdish state to exist? And my second comment is that uh, I don't think it's fair to refer to all the Iraqi fighters who are fighting the United States as uh, jihadis, uh, as, as, as you did earlier. Uh, that's, that's my, well, that's I, my I, comment. Thank uh, you. Thanks, Marvin. Thank you for that valid comment. Actually, I didn't say that they were necessarily fighting the, the U.S. I just meant mm. the uh, insurgents in the area when I referred to jihadis, and this is something we, you and I had uh, talked about. Uh, in, in response to, uh, to Marvin's questions, first thing, you know, uh, how would Turkey react? and what's, what's its opposition, basically? Well, Turkey is definitely opposed to the emergence of an independent Kurdish state, and I think that uh, the acquisition of Kirkuk by the Kurds will be seen as a stepping stone toward Kurdish independence, and that's why Turkey is so adamantly opposed uh, to this notion that, that Kirkuk would join the Kurdistan region. Uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, Turkey has uh, invested a lot of money into the Kurdistan region and I think is trying to, uh, to, to try to control that Kurdistan region by economic means, which is not necessarily bad for the Kurds and it could help them over time to, uh, to gain greater economic leverage. I guess also we should clarify, based on what Marvin was saying, about the, the issue of jihadis. I mean, they aren't all necessarily against uh, the external forces. And not everybody is a jihadi. I mean, there's an Iraqi insurgency out there and they're not all uh, fighting a holy war, uh, fighting for religious purposes. Many of the insurgents are fighting for nationalist purposes. Um, and uh, uh, there are some foreign elements, especially among the uh, so Al-Qaeda in Iraq, jihadi uh, insurgents, but there are many others who are, who are not part of that, and I think that ought to be recognized. Now, you're I I'm glad to have you here because, um, you know, with the work you've been doing recently and the book you've written, A Poisonous Affair, you've got into, as much as possible, into the, the psyche of the, the Kurdish mind uh, based on the, the, the issues that uh, they've gone through. And, and I want to quote uh, from your book, A Poisonous Affair, here, when you talk about the lack of mistrust that the Kurds have. So lack on the issue trust. of mistrust, yeah? Lack of trust. A lack of trust, yeah. Uh, I want to quote the book. It says, deep in the recesses of the Kurdish unconscious lies, uh, still lies the fear equivalent to an unmovable conviction that no central government can ever be trusted not to repeat such abominations, uh, referring to Halabja. This is one reason why Kurdish leaders have placed all their post-war energies into creating long-term protections for their people. How much flexibility does that leave them, and how much does that mistrust still remain in a, in a post-Saddam Hussein era in Iraq? Oh, the mistrust is very, very strong, and I, I think that ought to be recognized as a reality. Um, uh, whatever way we come down on what happened during the Iran-Iraq war, and of course, I'm very critical of, of the gassing of Halabja. Obviously, it was a crime against humanity, uh, but uh, we have to recognize that this, these events, Halabja and Anfal, totally shaped the Kurdish psyche, and everything they do today is determined by that. 
And so we have to deal with that reality. And But uh, obviously, they're trying to gain Kekuk for that reason. They're trying to maximize the territory that they will control and the powers that they will hold within that territory. Oh, based on what you said there, let me quote another uh, segment from your book here from A Poisonous Affair. And this one is talking about that fear. And you said how it shaped the psyche. And it says, for many years up after Halabja, the lives of ordinary Kurds were governed by fear, fear of a repressive state that punished harshly anyone who rejected its uh, its right, uh, as writ, sorry, as many Kurds did, and a much deeper gut wrench fear that could empty out whole towns at the mere mention of two words gas attack now in terms of like uh, I don't say perhaps military aspirations some kind of military protection uh, even if there was some kind of autonomy is that something uh, the Kurdish population has considered uh, autonomy yeah well I mean, in terms of having some sort of building up some kind of military protection well obviously uh, you know they have uh, used their Peshmerga forces to turn them into a, a regional protection force an army essentially and um, but, but the question is, will that be enough for them? And there's a, there's a, first of all, they would need some kind of international protection. But that may also mean that they will not become independent because I don't think there will be much international support for Kurdish independence. And so the question is really, what can the Kurds realistically achieve in the current period? And maybe they are overreaching, and especially you know, in, in terms of trying to get Kirkuk, which uh, faces uh, total opposition from other Iraqis as well as from neighboring states. Uh, and if they want to have a, a stable future, they may have to uh, l lower their sights a little bit, and probably. And plan ahead, as you were suggesting as well. And plan Look ahead rather than try to rush into it. Yeah, absolutely. Be very Let careful. We have another call on the line. I think it's uh, Ali on the line. Is that right? Go ahead. Ali in Bangkok. Go Hi, ahead. Hi, Aris. Thank you for your program. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, there are 14 million Kurds in the world. Why not the international community help them to have, a, to have them a state or a country for themselves? And my second question is, why is Turkish business in the Iraqi internal business to not allowing Kurds to have them uh, a state, to be freedom? As we know, you know, in Turkey, people, uh, Kurdish people, they were not allowed to speak them language either for years. Thank Ali, you. Ali, there's interesting points, and I know you touch on the, some of these issues in the book as well. Of course. Right? Yeah, yeah. In an ideal world, uh, there would be a Kurdish state, but uh, unfortunately, international politics is not made in an ideal world. Uh, we live in a very unideal world, an imperfect world, and so under the current circumstances, uh, simply it's not realistic uh, to have a Kurdish state in northern Iraq, let alone in the larger region. And I think the Kurdish leaders are very well aware of that and are actu actually very pragmatic. And uh, they're not pushing for that. I think they're trying to use the current period to maximize the possibilities of future independence. But it, may not, it will not happen in this generation, and it may not happen in the next, but hopefully sometime down the line it will work. Now, in your book, uh, A Poisonous Affair, you mention the position the U.S. took. I mean, standing on the, on the sidelines to some degree when all this was happening with uh, the gassing of the Kurds in, in Halabja. And I wonder now, when you look at the, the role the U.S. plays in the current situation, how has its role changed? What part could it play in actually stabilizing things? Well, the United States' role changed ever since the Kuwait War, when Saddam Hussein overstepped the red line and went into Kuwait and lost the friendship of the United States, which had supported it during the Iran-Iraq War and uh, helped, uh, you know, condoned the gassing of Iranian forces and Kurdish uh, civilians. Um, now, the United States is helping the Kurds, of course. I should just pick up on what you say. You actually condone the gassing of civilians? Well, I mean, they didn't uh, condemn it, uh, and they were very well aware that it was happening. So it's, Which uh, isn't necessarily the same as condoning, actually. Well, it's, 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 uh, it's, let's say, complicity by silence. All right. And, and in the Times, there was actually complicity more by, for example, uh, sharing satellite intelligence with the Iraqi forces that allowed them to gas the Iranians uh, more uh, efficiently. Uh, so, uh, and in Halabja, um, it, well, while it was clear that Iraq had gassed Halabja, um, uh, a cover story was, was concocted that uh, suggested that, in fact, the Iranians were responsible, or at least partly responsible. So there is some complicity there, I think. Um, but now the United States is, is of course, uh, much more on the Kurdish side, but, but not, uh, I don't think there's any Kurdish leader who really trusts the United States to be there for the Kurds, um, because there's Turkey as well, which is a U.S. ally, mm -hmm. there's the Iraqi central government, and so uh, I think the Kurds uh, will have to be very careful. I want to get an email to you that we got in, uh, just from uh, Georgia, and I'm uh, presuming this is Georgia, not in the USA. Uh, Anthony Favalli writes, what role must the UN and the Arab League and the European Union play to check this ruinous war propagated by the US and to turn this horrible situation around? Well, I would love there for, for there to be a, a role for the United Nations. Um, I think the Arab League is going to be very difficult to have any role in Iraq at the moment because of the uh, 
I'd say, deep rifts that exist within the Iraqi polity where, you know, um, the Arab League is, is, is deemed by one side in the conflict in Iraq to be uh, siding with the other side. And so, but as for the United Nations, which is still independent, um, you know, the United States has totally sidelined the United Nations. And for them to come back in after the trauma of the bombing in 2003 and the sidelining of the United States is going to be extremely difficult as long as the United States stays in charge. We have uh, time to squeeze in just one last question here from Bruno Druski in Paris, in France. And uh, Bruno says, um, earlier the, the Kurds, underst uh, they understand their chiefs are carrying on a suicidal policy, the better it will be for them. The earlier that they understand that it'll be uh, better for them. Since the seeds of the conflict in Iraq come mostly from outside the borders of Iraq, the non-intervention of foreign powers should be the main goal. Well, absolutely. Um, uh, Iraq should be a sovereign state where, where foreign powers are not involved. But the fact is we have 150,000 American troops on the ground in Iraq. And of course, because of the chaos that has been uh, caused by, by mis misguided U.S. policies, we now have other neighboring states getting more and more involved, Iran, Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. Syria, possibly Turkey. Uh, and uh, so this is the reality now. We need to find a way of rolling this all back. Well, Jos Tilteman, I thank you very much for joining us, and uh, thanks for chatting about this subject. Thank you. I just point out to you, the book is A Poisonous Affair, America, Iraq, and the Gassing of Halabja, the book by Jos Tilteman, who's uh, with the International Crisis Group. Thanks for being with us. On tomorrow's show, we take a look at the upcoming Turkish election and how the country might change dramatically depending on the outcome of that. Don't forget, if you have any thoughts about that or pressing issues, send your emails to riz at aljazeera.net. We'll see you next time. Street Talk's coming up next. <laughs>